Hi, welcome to Issues and Answers. I'm your host, Diane Kinderwater. We have plenty of color, intrigue, and fascination on our program today. And it's all wrapped up in one author and one nuclear scientist. He is a resident of New Mexico, of Santa Fe for the past 25 years. It's none other than Dr. Michael Gamble. Thank you for being a part of this program today. Oh, Diane, I'm so excited to be here. Thank one you for inviting me. One of our more me. colorful residents. Why do I say that? <laughs> it's because of your fascinating background. You have written a book, and we're going to discuss that at length today, Zero Escape. We're going to discuss your book, Terrific. but also as a nuclear scientist, we're going to discuss what is the future of our energy, which we're all concerned oh, about as the price of gas goes up. I so what do you too. want to touch upon first? Well, we could talk a little bit about what we could do for energy policy in the country. Okay. It looks like we, we've uh, foundered somewhat in our energy policy, Diane. I don't see where there's a firm commitment to going forward with renewable energy in the country. And I see that things like uh, unpopular programs like the uh, Keystone XL pipeline have been tabled. So when we look at uh, drilling or, or we look at uh, organic policy, that doesn't look like that's very clear either. When you speak of renewable energy, what are you speaking about? Yeah, well, renewable energy, that's certainly the one that interests me most. And even though we do have uh, indigenous in the country, we have plenty of coal, coal enough to last 200 years. But when you look at the deleterious impact on the environment, do we really want to burn coal going forward to create electricity? Uh, natural gas is very clean. But it turns out in about 1979, there was legislation on the books, or pending legislation, where that would say that natural gas should not be used for generation of electricity because it was a scarce resource. We and have plenty of it in the Four Corners here in New Mexico, about well, the turns, Farmington area, right? Yeah, yeah, it seems like San Juan. We've well, got we have a gas. great deal now, and as a matter of fact, the prices are near historic lows for natural gas. But any time you burn fossil fuels, you release hydrocarbons into the air. You release CO2, there's water vapor. And uh, it's one of the, those things where if we were able to find the ultimate or able to harness the ultimate renewable energy source, which is nuclear fusion, that would be the most exciting development in, in our lifetimes. It turns out we've got nuclear fission in lots of installations. We generate about 20% of our total electric in the United States using nuclear fission. In France, they generate about 80% of their total electric. And nuclear fission is where you take a very massive uranium atom, generally, and you smack a neutron into it, and the uranium atom blows apart, liberating energy. That's one mechanism. The, the renewable, and you could call that a renewable energy source, in, in that we have so much fuel available in the country, and in that we, we don't have to export or import anything in order to carry on a nuclear power industry using or based on fission technology. But we haven't built a nuclear fission plant for 30 years. We haven't, but there are two new ones that were licensed, you know, just a month ago. They got their licenses in Georgia, the Vogel plants, I believe they're called, and they are the most modern generation plants, so-called three plus. When you look at Fukushima and some of the, the you know, the horrible accident that occurred there, that was a second or so-called second generation fission plant. The, uh, the current plants that are being licensed are three plus, and the fourth generation nuclear scenario would be nuclear fusion, where you take very light nuclei, the lightest, in fact, hydrogen, and you use either very strong crushing magnetic fields or highly penetrating lasers, which is what I worked on when I first came to Los Alamos, was the laser fusion modality. And you compress the hydrogen atoms together such that they fuse, and that liberates energy. You said two um, nuclear plants have been licensed in the past month. Right. Why did it take 30 years for that to happen? <laughs> That's, uh, that, the answer to that would be multifaceted. There is definitely a political component to that. Are the, we, mainly, are we afraid of nuclear power? Well, that would be the societal component. <laughs> But are we? Are yeah, we as I, I and why? We are, we are. Well, things like um, and sh what should we be? Well, I, we should respect it, just like I respect lightning. There has been no loss of life from the commercial nuclear industry in the history of it. So, given that perspective or that fact, that's certainly something. That's an arrow in the quiver uh, for the industry. What about fusion? Will that have the same? 
Fusion is much safer. Concerns. And the waste, you know, once again, there, whenever you talk about the cost of nuclear technology or, or nuclear, commercial nuclear power, and people say, oh, but you're not counting in the hideously expensive cost of the entire fuel cycle, and that is where you deal with the radioactive wastes. I mean, the krypton and the strontium and the xenon. There, there are, are uh, substantial nuclear waste that are generated in the commercial nuclear power but sector. But with fusion, there, there wouldn't with be this? With fusion, the, the byproduct is water, helium and water. And so it's something that could be generally vented out the stack. When could that come online? It would be marvelous if it came online in our lifetimes. It's uh, the materials issue. Uh, you know, my postdoc at MIT was in materials science. And so the materials issues are, are some of the issues that plague nuclear fusion, you're looking at establishing 100 million degrees absolute temperature inside a bottle, if you will, whether it be a magnetic bottle or some sort of confinement modality. And then on the outside, you have ambient temperature. You've got 273 degrees K on one side and a million degrees K on the other side. Nature hates that differential. It's, uh, it's very challenging to overcome that. At uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, I think we've got our best shot at seeing ignition which is the break-even point where we, it takes about as much energy to make the reaction to, to uh, initiate it a, as it does for it to continue and to sustain itself. Anything else about renewable energy that you'd like to share? When you examine the fact that either we're going to continue to despoil our environment using fossil fuels, and in fact a coal-fired plant uh, releases about a hundred times more radiation into the environment than a nuclear power plant under normal operating conditions. So that's something to consider. Furthermore, when we talk about renewable energy, number one on the list of many people is hydroelectric power. Oh, the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam Look is at, what we have. Yeah, I mean, not the Rio Grande, we won't be getting for the Rio Grande, but the Hoover Dam. Yeah, well, it's not, well probably that may, that may disrupt the silvery minnow. You know, we, they may get a headache or something if there were a dam there. But <laughs> in the case of, in the case of uh, uh, hydroelectric power, when you look at the risk assessment and you say, well, we're talking about the safety, we're interested in the public safety. Well, from a risk assessment perspective, which is the probability of an accident or any event multiplied times the consequences of that event, by that definition, a hydroelectric plant is much, much more risk. dangerous than a nuclear power plant because should a dam burst, millions could die. I'm a big fan of photovoltaics, and if we talk about, you know, residential deployment of photovoltaic cells on the top of your house, you know, I'm glad there's not a sofa. I'd want to get up and jump up and down about that, because you can have renewable energy and save money at the same time. You know, you can do something good for the environment, and you can do something that is uh, appropriate from a cost-effective perspective. That is, but wind is not so much? Wind, wind and solar, the downfall is that this nuclear power plant, when we talk about in Georgia, that they're one gigawatt call them nominally one gigawatt plants. In, in order in New Mexico, in Alamogordo, they have 50 acres of solar collectors that are generating, you know, five megawatts. This is 10 acres a megawatt, and we're talking a gigawatt is a thousand times a megawatt. So it, it, it's so diffuse. Nuclear energy is, um, is highly concentrated. It's very energy dense. And that's another thing that gives it a leg up for a society that's that's expanding at an enormous rate, or that is a is a, such as China and such as India. That's right. Those economies that are going up now. If the United States is going to level off, if we're not going to have the leadership role and the position that we had in the world in the past decades and so forth, well, we might tolerate not have using mm -hmm. very highly dense energy forms. But I think we need to we need to regain our leadership position, not relinquish it. It's amazing here in the Sun Belt, you know, in New Mexico, it's uh, you can a solar installation, say 400 square feet on top of your house, can pay for itself over a period of 10 years. Now, passive solar, there was a there was a piece in the New Mexican on a Monday in February, I remember, about standards for new energy efficient homes, so-called green homes. And there is a, a meter stick or a metric mm -hmm. for determining what home is green. A passive solar was advocated there, but active solar with a battery system and with something to recharge back to the grid was not uh, in the fore in that mm -hmm. article. Same time. What about yeah. closing off some rooms that you're not using and just using space heaters? Yeah. Well, what, oh, space heaters are very energy hungry. 
any, anything that has a coil, anything that, that glows with a coil. Now in Xeroscape, I point out the difference in the energy that's coming off a glowing coil of a, of a foot heater and a laser. It's, it's called a Q value. I know later Too much. we'll talk about that. Well, no, let's talk about that now. Oh, nice segue yeah. into Xeroscape in terms of, we talked about lasers and uh -huh. uh, what was it, black? What was it? In the, in the comic books of, of decades, in the early 60s, what uh -huh. do they talk about? Oh, oh the gamma ray, the, gamma the death rays. ray. The death they ray, not about the death the ray. Death ray. Yes. Do you include something about tell <laughs> gamma well, rays and death rays? Again, this yeah. is an espionage thriller based in Los Alamos. It is. You worked is. there 10 years. I did, off and on. I worked there yeah, some number of years and then consulted when I did my postdoc at MIT. I came back to the lab in the summers and would uh, consult with them. but. Uh, uh, that was on high energy physics uh, pursuits. Now, reading this, are we going to learn all about high energy physics, or is this no. an easy? Is this an easy read? Or we I hope it's an interesting read. It was <laughs> I should say interesting, it not was, necessarily easy. It was but designed. Yeah. It's thrilling. There is an opportunity to learn a little bit about laser sciences in reading the book. More than we learned in the show today? A, a little bit more than we learned in the show today. <laughs> we learned pretty much on this <laughs> well, show we did, Well, we learned about using lasers to accomplish nuclear fusion which is, is the holy grail for renewable energy. Now we make a fine distinction in laser science and grazer science. So when you have a laser, which we're all familiar with, and that was one of the reasons I chose that is it's ubiquitous. Everywhere, you know, in society, I had laser eye surgery twice I last thinking, year. I see <laughs> laser pointers. Don't laser they? pointer, I mean, it's, it's the ubiquitous. Kids have all it's, those. it's everywhere. And this is the laser. And this is just the light. Well, l lasing is the light. It's light amplification by stimulated emission radiation. It's a nice handy acronym. Laser. For laser. For laser, yeah. that's right. Grazer is gamma ray emission. Gamma ray laser is something that has been sought for decades by labs in Russia and all over the world in India. To fight back, shoot down, I thought. Well, well that's what I posit in the book, that, that, the, that a Soviet, former Soviet Republic, they perfect a gamma ray laser. So in a gamma ray laser, you use transitions in the nucleus to eject photons, and the nucleons are a thousand times, 1800 times more massive than electrons, so it's much more penetrating the light that comes out. That's why a grazer or a gamma ray laser could be able to shoot down a rocket in the boost phase from a ground but facility. But we don't have them now. No, we don't, but that Russian, those Ruskies, oh. they're pretty smart, so you have to read the book to understand whether they actually accomplished it. And then it, the, the job falls to Los Alamos to validate the threat, because the balance of power you know, the thing that's maintained peace in the, in the world in recent history, modern history, has been the concept of mutual assured destruction. That if you have nuclear weapons and we have nuclear weapons, if you launch a preemptive strike, surely we will have a retaliative strike. But if someone developed a, a weapon with which, or a nuclear counter weapon, with which they could volley, or they, they could... Uh, Shoot down our weapon. Or, or, or the weapon. ones that were coming in. We could launch a preemptive yeah. strike, and then we could, the retaliative strike could be thwarted. You've upset the balance of power and in that's the what world. The, that's what your book is based that's on, the, book the is Soviets. About. The Soviets perfect the perfected gamma ray laser. it, and we have to find out, Los Alamos is supposed to find out if they actually did do that. That's right, and if they did it, then we need to build a better one. <laughs> Bigger and better. So what's the espionage part of this? There is a mole that has managed to embed himself in the hierarchy of the laboratory, the management of the laboratory, and he's just waiting for an opportunity to go and take over the top, the directorship of the lab. Mm. So really all of the dancing and all of the ballyhooing about the gamma ray laser is meant to facilitate the, the elevation of a deep cover mole to the directorship. This book is, uh, it's not a damning of the laboratory at all. It's a cautionary tale of what must not be allowed to happen at any facility of that magnitude. Very good. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Gamble. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being a resident of Santa Fe and being on the show. Wouldn't live anywhere. Very good.